You're watching The Metabolic Reset by Dr. Alyssa Gall on Resonance Wellness TV, part of our Whole Life Medicine Alleviate series. Keep in the loop about future webinars and events on whole-life-medicine.com. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Metabolic Reset webinar. My name is Dr. Alyssa Gall, and I'll be your host and guide this evening about all things metabolism. Um, our lecture on the metabolic reset today is coming under both alleviate and align from the whole life medicine model, which are the first two steps in health strategy at Resonance Wellness. Um, alleviate, um, which is what most of you are already familiar with if you are um, have been attending these webinars, is the first step in the approach. And so when we talk about metabolism, we are talking about starting points in um, alleviate, but also in align. Um, so in short, there's going to be six considerations when we're looking at strategies to resolve a metabolic issue. Um, the first is to consider, again, what are the root causes in the health situation and asking ourselves what the setup is. So diet is a chief lifestyle intervention in any natural health plan for both the prevention and treatment of disease, obviously. And when we make changes to diet, we really affect how things are set up to operate biologically. The second is to look at the state of the tissues involved. In the clean slate process, we're looking at how to improve the cleaning up of the tissues that get bogged down in disease processes. And with metabolic intervention, you're gonna see improved maintenance of body tissues and much better tissue cleanup. Diet's also the best place to obtain missing ingredients for all metabolic and repair in your body. And so the quality and nature of what you're eating play a huge role. And supplementation can also play a role here. With big lifestyle changes though, you're also gonna come up against a few more things that belong to the aligned level of health strategy. So metabolic issues are often related to stress patterning and condition programs in the autonomic nervous system and the body's psychoneuroimmunological response. So you heard that word right, that's PNEI, the combination of your psyche, your nervous system, your hormones, and your immunity. And on the road to awareness, you're gonna find out about these things. You can also do a survey of events um, that could be in the way of your body's healing. So an inventory of energy changing health challenges, such as surgeries or injuries, dental problems, um, vaccinations, chronic infections, or other types of physical trauma. So you can ask what parts of your body are under the most stress as a result? Which areas have become less responsive and open to normal regulation? And you might need to reconnect a pathway to become more aligned. And then lastly, in the revitalize strategy, um, Thrive support systems or revive th uh, support systems is really about learning more about how to create a great life support system through diet, maintenance of problem spots, particular exercise suited to the person once things are cleaned up and a metabolic reset. So learning basic meditation, heart math techniques, um, breath work, starting to really um, uh, design aspects of your life on purpose can be part of a metabolic reset. Now, the motivation to do this lecture in January is the obvious one. <laughs> so patients often make resolutions at this time of year to do something about their health. And so that's why I planned this webinar and also why I plan to do something a little bit more involved and a little bit special for those of you who are interested in your own metabolic reset. So let's just get started right now and hear about what you've tried to get onto the healthy bandwagon. You can always type it into the chat box. Um, and as you know, and you've probably heard me say before, I have really seen every diet come and go in the past 20 years. So many people struggle with finding solutions to feeling like the body they live in is not a happy place physically, mentally, or emotionally. So your body's your temple, and that doesn't mean you're gonna look perfect all the time, but it does mean that you have to bring your awareness to bear on what your body is experiencing in the moment. When I first started in practice, um, I was mostly vegetarian because 
20, oh gosh, I guess it's almost, yeah, 25 years ago, I went to medical school. Um, in naturopathic school at that time, um, it was really thought that vegetarianism was the very best um, approach to diet. Of course, there is good evidence for eating vegetables. And we'll try to talk about that in a little bit um, of time here. But I actually was a really bad vegetarian um, because at that time, it kind of gave everybody free license to just eat a lot of pasta. And um, there wasn't the anti-carb craze that there that there is at present. But I can tell you, I became a, a pretty chubbed out vegetarian. It wasn't balanced for me. And there was lots of reasons why. Um, but suffice it to say, by the time I got back to Calgary, I wasn't vegetarian anymore. I'd also lived in Europe by that time. And their dietary um, uh, strategies are also different. So it kind of dawned on me that maybe that wasn't all of the solution. When I came back, I also um, took over a practice where the naturopath was using the blood type diet. And I used that diet with the patients because they were already on those diets for about a year. And at the end of the year, I just remember thinking, you know, this diet is random. It sometimes works for people. A lot of the time it doesn't. It's not really measurable. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I started to do more research into how to individualize diet. Because, and it turns out nowadays, I don't know if you know this or not, but the blood type diet um, was written by a man who's actually since replaced his system um, pretty dramatically. And so, but of course, the new system is much harder to follow because it's a little bit more individualized. Um, it was originally the blood type diet based on lectin chemistry. And so it, it's an oversimplification of lectin chemistry, unfortunately. And so even though sometimes it accidentally really helped somebody, it wasn't for the reason that um, was touted originally. And so um, all the diets that I've seen come and go have all had reasonable explanations behind them and sometimes beautiful explanations. The problem is sometimes the explanations are too beautiful and not really practical or reliable or reproducible. And that is actually a different problem. So when you look at where um, the average person is at, so this, this is actually a former survey about the varieties of programs and weight loss goals that people have had. This isn't this particular group, but it's likely similar in this group. So numbers in each of these, you know, like categories of trying things, just generally speaking, go up and down depending on what year it is. There is so much confusion amongst patients about what to do to create better body health in a meaningful way. And even when we look at the range of approaches here, you can see that there are diets that are diametrically opposed. And in my experience, there's several issues that come up when enthusiasm wanes and the results are not what you expected, or if they only seem effective in the short term. And there are a lot of times where um, many of these approaches can be very effective in the short term, but in the long term, they don't really teach people necessarily to eat in a way that actually serves them, um, serves their health, you know, serves their energy, serves what what goals they're trying to achieve. And so this, this, like I said, is a huge confusion. You can see all the different kinds that are here. There's Weight Watchers, there's Dr. Bernstein, there's paleo, there's calorie restriction, ketogenic, you know, like you, you name it. I've seen the diets go. Originally, there were Atkins and Pritikin. I don't know if you're old enough to remember those things, all of us uh, maybe are, but there, there really have been any number of different dietary strategies. These are just some of the more current ones. So I want to talk about why most programs fail. Um, because really at the end of the day, it's, it's really not a simple case of calories in and calories out. Eating less and exercising more is not a surefire solution in most cases. If it was, we would all be skinny. Um, the individual isn't taken into account. So people are unique in what they inherit from metabolic strengths and weaknesses. So genes do play a, a role 
but not in the way that most people think. Like for some reason we have these ideas, there's certain genes that make people fat. And I mean, I've seen the newspaper articles as I'm sure you have that say, oh, this gene is responsible and you know, mice get fat if this gene is deleted or whatever. And that's to degree that's true, but really it's a very weak influence. Um, some people might be strongly influenced by that, but it's certainly not the majority. Um, three, food is cultural and it's social. And what we learn about food comes from family and from social structures. And this is not always the healthiest representation of food. Um, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit more as we kind of go along, but there are a lot of people who would just like to eat um, their like classic family diet because that's what they know. And a lot of the time those diets are very comfort food based. Um, by comfort food, I mean that they just have a tendency to be like all of those rare tastes in nature that we're all biologically programmed to seek out as a complete um, diet picture. That doesn't work, but lots of people will try to eat like that. And so we always come up against the challenge of, um, yeah, I'll do a diet to weight, lose weight, whatever it's going to be. You know, I'll do it extremely for four weeks or eight weeks or whatever, you know, time window I'm willing to give it. But then after that, I just want to go back to my quote unquote normal diet. And so I want to challenge the concept of normal diet. The next thing is that hormonal balance isn't often taken into consideration in eating plans. Um, so a program often doesn't reset the hormone cascade and no hormone works in isolation. So you really need to look at that whole picture and then rebalance what's not working. They also don't pay very much attention to the subconscious mind, which is a very powerful processor. It's processing data at about 100,000 times the overall amount as your conscious mind. So getting cookies for comfort as a kid can be totally imprinted in your mind. You know, you turn to cookies when you feel upset. <laughs> These types of things can really sabotage your efforts. Most programs also focus too much on weight and not really enough on health um, measures or how people feel or improvements in symptomatology. Um, and so it becomes like this, you know, unattainable number sometimes, or, you know, like this number that we're all striving for. It definitely represents something, but it's not everything. Most um, programs can be very superficial and they're short term focused and losing weight should really move you in direction of your best self and your best life, not just your smallest weight. Um, most programs don't increase resilience or stress tolerance as part of the strategy. There's generally speaking, not enough accountability. You know, there's certainly programs that have kind of um, hit the market that have a much better accountability strategy. Um, and that's always useful, you know, especially if you are with people in that accountability structure that you know and trust. And most problem programs really just not sustainable in the long term, not because some of the food um, changes aren't healthy and useful and necessary, but because you have to learn how to make that sustainable for yourself in the long term um, so that you feel like you're not restricted. So I do want to talk a little bit about disordered body image. And of course, I'm going to apologize up front to the men in our audience here. But this is a graph that is more particular to women. It is the graph that plots the average American woman versus the Miss Universe winners since the 1950s. Um, on the horizontal axis is the year and on the vertical axis is the body mass index measurement. And um, what that is, is the measure of weight adjusted for height. And I want to point out three things about this graph. One is that um, what we consider to be the ideal in beauty appears to be in very stark contrast to how most women are, knowing that this graph actually shows women in their 20s. Um, the second is that the average young woman um, in the United States uh, from this graph, but really extrapolated easily to the Canadians, is now overweight from a medical standpoint with a BMI of 30 considered to be obese. So you can see um, the lines um, 
like when you hit just over 30, you consider to be obese. And lots of people at this stage in the game, the average person is technically overweight. The third thing I want to show is that the gap is growing between the beauty pageant ideal and our average. So people are probably getting unhealthier both physically and probably from like looking at those contrasts mentally. Now this is more marked, um, you know, in awareness amongst women, but certainly it also has an impact um, for men as well. Not that they want to be the next Miss Universe, but <laughs> just in perception, cultural perception. And when I when I looked at this graph, I was just like, wow. I mean, it's just not getting any better. <laughs> at least in the 50s, you know, what people looked like and what their beauty pageant ideal was, was closer, you know. Next thing is that um, there's interesting problems also with being too low of a BMI. So when you look... This is data from multiple studies represented here that shows that both a really low BMI, so think Miss Universe of the current decade, and a high BMI, so think the average girl, have an increased risk of death. So some of the smallest Miss Universes actually have a higher risk of dying than some of the overweight normal gals based on BMI. So I don't want to get people into the head space that, you know, being tiny physically is necessarily more healthy. Just like being more able to run is not necessarily more healthy. Somebody who exercises extremely isn't necessarily more resilient or fit. We confuse the out, outer appearance sometimes or the, um, you know, the, a time, a running time or uh, a cardiovascular output as being something that we can bank on, but it isn't always. And this also adds to the confusion, I think. Next thing is too that I, I just want to point out, we're just getting more sedentary um, with time. And this is actually an interesting graph that shows that actually is showing multiple different um, study outcomes against each other. So what we're seeing here is the rate of adult obesity rising from 1950 to the present um, or to within the last 10 years. So that's the red line. We're also looking at the average intake of calories go up from 2,100 calories on average to 2,800 calories on average. So that's an increase of a quarter of your caloric intake. We're also seeing adolescent obesity rising at this point, pretty much parallel to adult obesity. We're also seeing that this has a, a correlation in the amount of car, number of cars that we have. Um, so just less movement in general, less walking, structures of cities that don't encourage um, actually walking out of your house to work. Of course, we can make modifications for those things. Um, but I mean, when you look at it, you just can't argue with that kind of correlation of data. And last but not least, um, since it's become more of a household thing, households with computers, we're also seeing, you know, certain trend data there. So, you know, we eat too much and move too little in general. Um, everybody knows that, but sometimes you really need to see the statistics slap you in the face where you're like, hmm, maybe I should make a little bit of a change around that. Now, also, um, I want to point out that as a culture, we're really suffering from disordered eating in general. Um, and here you can see some not so great statistics about eating disorders, which are by no means limited to women, as you can see here. So anorexia nervosa <clears throat> in both women and men is when uh, people decrease um, the amount of food that they're eating to starvation levels. Um, this is a very serious problem. Um, which is not always entirely related just to body image. Many people um, around you will have suffered from some sort of eating disorder, including anorexia. If it's severe, it, um, it has a very strong risk of death. Um, the second uh, main eating disorder is bulimia nervosa. That's where people vomit after breathing or binge eat and vomit. Um, and then the last but not least is binge eating disorder. So 
where people uncontrollably eat, um, not necessarily purging, where you have people who are um, hiding, you know, food in, you know, private spaces um, or eating in the car on the way home and then eating regularly outside of that. This is much more prevalent than most people realize. And uh, again, I think people are always surprised to see that there's also a fair number of men participating in this kind of activity. Um, and I have the very sobering statistic here that every 62 minutes, somebody literally dies of an eating disorder. So what makes a metabolic reset different um, than just trying another standard diet? So how can we approach this so that we're actually getting a, a much better um, and more sustainable outcome? I think if we, we're going to talk about some of these um, pieces today, you know, it can really be a mental and physical transformation to approach it from a different perspective. Um, it's more likely to result in permanent weight loss when we address some of these major issues. It can really address and correct the cause and not just the symptom of being overweight. Um, it can be really done by anyone. You don't require exercise to lose weight. Um, you can get a supportive network going. Um, you can eat real food and develop sustainable, healthy habits. But most of all, what I want to do is help you find your hidden metabolic challenges. So some of those things are already going to be, you're going to be aware of them already, I'm sure. And some of them you're not. So let's take a look at some of the most common things that might need help and be addressed by doing a bit of a metabolic reset. Um, obviously, diet is one of them. Hormones is another. Um, stress is another. Self-talk, huge one. And also toxicity. We're going to talk about these areas here in an, um, more detail so that you get a sense of what I'm talking about. So um, let's start with the obvious one. Let's start with dietary balance. So um, what is the most balanced way to eat? That is a challenging um, question for lots of people because, like I said, we have so many interesting ideas about eating. Um, so, like, if if we look back, I don't know how many of you have participated in Start Here, Start Now. That was last year's um, a webinar series where we did 18 webinars on like the basics of health and all sorts of different topic areas. But we did talk about this in the dietary um, strategy section. And we, um, we looked at this um, ideal plate idea. So this is not a rocket science idea. It is a very interestingly simple way of starting. So if there is like nothing else that you can do or bend your head around, but do this, this will be a really great start. Because statistically, when we have a dinner plate that's divided in this way, um, or the overall food that you're eating in a day is proportioned like this, volume wise, you're going to come actually really close to improving all health outcomes. So let me be more specific. So half of this plate is non-starchy veggies. Um, and just to be clear, I used this picture and it included carrots in here. Carrots are starchy when they're cooked up. When they're raw, they're considered not really starchy. So we'll just say carrots are in their raw state on this side. Um, and then 25% high quality proteins and fats. 12% maximum fruit. 12% starchy veggies and whole grains. So that's like peas, corn, you know, like that classic pea, carrot, corn mix that everybody counts as like vegetables, but really is just more starch. Um, potatoes are there, pasta's there, rice and other grains are there. Um, even for the sake of argument, I would, I would even put quinoa and things like that there, even though, yes, they have more protein, relatively speaking. Uh, but what we want to see really is a huge amount of non-starchy vegetables. Now this could be relatively hard to pull off um, in the average like restaurant meal, as an example. 
Um, because typically this is not what you get served because this is not considered the ideal, right? We've, when people got to have more money socioeconomically, they were looking for all the rare things that nobody could afford to have before. And so nowadays we have like these amazing restaurant meals that taste wonderful and they are really loaded towards the, you know, fat and protein and starch and they just are. I've also listed here 1% ferments. So things like natural sauerkraut or pickles, um, and then 1% salt and seaweed. So you do need some salt and seaweed is actually a really nice mineral mix. If you use the right kind of salt, it's also a really good electrolyte mineral mix. So if all you can do is make it look like this, um, then that would be awesome. You know, we talked a little bit about this um, in food prep as well. So if you missed um, that webinar earlier uh, in the fall of 2019, you can go back and take a look at it. And what we talked about is different ways of like shifting how you're eating to be healthier and to do so in, in a way where like you can also prep for it. Um, so there'll be a whole bunch of ideas there if you're missing some ideas. So like I said, not rocket science, just make your dinner plate look like that. The second piece I really want to mention in terms of um, dietary strategy is that your metabolism is this big interconnected web. Um, my perception of how patients view metabolism is that there's a kind of tendency to make it an oversimplification about like the calorie in, calorie out sort of thing. Or that somehow this is kind of like vague term metabolism that, you know, you have this kind of metabolism and as a consequence, you don't, it doesn't change or you're stuck with this metabolism. Um, the reality is everything that happens in your body is interconnected. So on the left hand side here, you're just seeing like um, the, the connected reactions with the center reactions that are in the darker um uh, dots and the circle at the end, that's the citric acid cycle and all of the things that go into carbohydrate metabolism in particular. And what all these other side pathways are, are all sorts of related um, interconnected processes. So if you look, it's, it's a little bit hard on this. Um, hopefully you can see this a bit bigger on, on your screen. But there are nucleotide metabolism in red here. So that's basically DNA repair and production. Biodegradation of xenobiotics is in the upper right. That's basically detoxifying things that are coming from outside of your body. There's metabolism of amino acids, um, which of course are precursors to neurotransmitters and functional immune molecules. There's metabolism of cofactors and the incorporation of vitamins on the lower right. Um, corner. There's certain types of vitamins, obviously, that you produce. There's the biosynthesis of like secondary metabolites, so things that you actually need to get rid of. There's lipid metabolism. There's energy metabolism, which is your mitochondrial processes. There's um, the metabolism of more complex fats or lipids and the metabolism of more complex carbs. So all of these things, like your hormones are in this um, location as part of your lipid metabolism, your neurotransmitters, your immune signaling molecules. You cannot separate anything that goes on in your body from the metabolism, from the energy producing reactions that you do on a daily basis. There is no separation. So when you get the diet right for yourself, you're not just changing your dietary habits. You're literally changing everything across the board. So we can get very specific about what things actually are best suited to you or what things you most likely need and what is that, that balance going to look like long term. So um, at, in the office, we use the approach that's called metabolic typing. Now, there are other ways of going about this. However, um, if you haven't heard of that, it's very simple in office testing that can really help you figure out what you need to increase and decrease in your diet. 
both in terms of selections of foods and fine tuning. So if you took that dinner plate idea that we just talked about, you could get much more specific about what, what are the best things within those categories for yourself. Now, um, when we use metabolic typing in office, that's one of the first things I would ever do if somebody has cancer or somebody has a really significant inflammatory disease. Because most of the time, if we get the diet right like that, we can really make huge differences in that. Meaning, you know, starting to resolve tumors, you know, changing severe rheumatoid illnesses. These things are totally possible with diet. It's just that most of us are not sick enough to make a really huge effort at changing it. Um, and it takes a bunch of support. I, you know, like really, this is what we're talking about is all the elements that you're going to have to bring together to actually make your effort successful long term. But even if we look at metabolic typing and we compare that to gene, like gene testing, we'll often find a high correlation between what we're finding there and what we actually need to do for the person or, or what we can predict we need to do for the person from a genetic standpoint. Because what's making the differences between people in the metabolism on this chart is that every single one of these dots represents an enzyme. And those enzymes are read directly off of your DNA. So you have this many enzymes some of them are going to be more efficient. Some of them are going to be less efficient. If you're Inuit, you are designed to eat whale blubber. You know, if you are Mediterranean, totally different strategy. If you're Southeast Asian, different strategy. Now, not we're all Canadian here. Um, and that can mean lots of different things. Most of the time, if people have been in Canada for a long time, it means they have a Heinz 57 of genes. Sometimes that actually improves your um, overall metabolism and sometimes it does not so um, but if we know what your metabolism needs and we feed it like that we can make massive changes across the board and I've seen people make hormonal changes just by changing diet definitely weight changes definitely inflammation changes it's just a question of of getting it organized and this is one way of doing it now another thing that's become more popular to talk about in recent um, probably in the last yeah, year, two years, I've heard a lot more talk about um, fasting and intermittent fasting. Um, and it is becoming more clear with both time and research that meal timing patterns can have an effect on your overall metabolic balance. Um, and I would kind of look at it like this, when there's not enough time for your body to rest between meals, um, rhythm is lost you know, like metabolic rhythm is lost. It is like being in traffic 24 hours per day if you're constantly eating. And um, so research is really showing that eating intermittently is healthier and it seems to contribute to better metabolic control. Um, for one thing, the, the standard meal pattern, which is what we're seeing here in A, so A is showing you daytime hours, you know, like breakfast and lunch, a snack, and then an evening meal, and then potentially an evening snack, and then a short window where you don't eat out of your 24 hours. But really, that no human being um, on average has eaten like that, um, except for probably in the last, you know, 40 years when people got wealthy enough to eat like this. And also, again, from a, um, a pop psychology way, um, depending on what people heard in the media or were taught early by their doctors or other healthcare providers. We already know that a lot of the health advice that, that used to be given you know, 40, 50 years ago, is, a lot of it is blatantly wrong. And it continues to kind of just live on. In pop psychology, I'm, it always cracks me up to, to um, stand at the checkout at a grocery store where they have like all the magazines and realize how many like, dietary myths are basically like in black and white on the covers and of course those are the things that you're exposed to all the time you know you're not there necessarily doing all the research to prove it or disprove it but you see all these headlines that have absolutely no basis in reality right so like a case in point like as an example breakfast is the best meal of the or the most needed meal of the day if you don't have that then it's not going to work for you and you know everybody's heard that now does that apply to everybody of course not doesn't make any sense at all. So um, 
I have to admit to you that I have never been a breakfast eater pretty much my entire existence. That is actually not because any no nobody in my family eats like that but me. I just never really felt good from eating breakfast. And I don't usually, I still don't, you know, after 50 years of life, I still don't eat any uh, breakfast for the most part. Um, and I actually just find that, that works better for me. My energy is better. I don't eat until lunch. And I usually haven't eaten since like seven, eight o'clock in the evening. And that works for me totally. Now, it cracked me up when this started to come up as a potential um, weight management strategy in this last little while. And, and again, you know, maybe I just naturally did something that kind of was works for some people. And, and it, like I said, it works for me for sure. But it doesn't work for everybody. You have to know your own body and the responses of your own body. And that's, again, part of finding your metabolic reset is what works for you in that way. For some people, you know, there's here's a there's a chart here on this that's on the on the bottom left where it says what's the common diet. So the common diet is you eat a so you eat this pattern every single day of the week. Um, you can also have restricted feeding where you just eat a smaller amount and you only eat it you know between six a.m. and six p.m. Um, a more popular one nowadays is the five and two diet. So where you're eating um, more restricted. Um, for some of the days and then you're eating, you know, like um, between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. The, the other days. That's actually a diet that by research has been shown to both help improve breast, breast cancer outcomes and prevent it. So that, that diet is actually the um, uh, result of a, a bunch of research in, in Manchester of the United Kingdom. There's uh, a Dr. Harvey that is doing this research. And um, there's, of, there's of course, research for other types of fasting and meal arrangements. Um, but so it's, you know, alternate day fasting is another option. Some people can't do that. Um, alternate day restricted eating, you know, going between regular and, and restriction. Um, in animal models, for sure, it's shown that if you decrease calories and you insert um, time frames where you don't um, have people or have mice eating that it actually does um, have an impact on on metabolic control for sure it does and if you like I said if you look historically human beings aren't we're not really designed to eat like diet a there's just not really been his you know up until western civilization that just didn't happen people didn't eat like that and so it might be part of the reason why we look so overfed and and our bodies are so um, overwhelmed by the extra um, food. So it's something to think about. And it's certainly something to think about in terms of your responses, because again, you're the expert on your body. Next thing, of course, hormonal balance. So this is a common complicating issue in losing weight. Um, so let's talk about this. No hormone functions in isolation, and they have a collective impact on your metabolism. As a result, um, your body, both in shape and in health. So hormones are chemical messengers that regulate mood and appetite, metabolism controls, temperature, energy, and more. And they're produced by the endocrine glands. So that includes the pituitary, the thyroid, the pancreas, the adrenal, and the ovaries and testes. And chronically imbalanced lifestyles typically create imbalanced hormones. Hormones don't just imbalance themselves. It isn't random. It isn't unexplainable. Um, it, they, they fluctuate daily. They fluctuate monthly. And as we age, um, each of us has tendencies towards certain things going out of balance first. So you can see this in how people gain weight, as in the women's shapes that are depicted here. And sorry, I put that little banner kind of across the hips of the, of the women there. So some of it is a little bit harder to see. But um, there are characteristic patterns when certain hormones are not doing as well as they should. So um, as an example, the middle lady here is shown with an ovarian imbalance, uh, ovarian-oriented imbalance, where all of the weight is really held from the waist down. And everybody's seen somebody who's suffered from this kind of imbalance before because, you know, you might be sitting in a meeting with somebody at a conference table and they stand up, you realize how much weight they actually are carrying in their bottom. Or you have people who look very square. You know, the legs and the, and the arms are very skinny. The, fat, the neck tends to be very... 
um, almost non-existent and the body looks very square. That's, that's more adrenal looking pattern. So you can tell somebody's adrenals not doing well under those conditions or a thyroid type. Like I'm a thyroid type. So if I'm going to gain weight, it's going to be in my upper arms, the, the bottom sides of my face, um, chest, low abdomen, kind of like muffin top. And so those are areas where if your thyroid is imbalanced, you typically will see weight gain and loss first. So these are not the only ones. There's also a pituitary imbalance where everybody um, in that imbalance tends to put weight on all the way across their body, all the way down to the fingertips. Um, and so you can, you can clearly, and sometimes there's combinations, obviously, but you can usually clearly find examples of people that you know that will have these tendencies around you. And you'll see that people will have specific cravings relating to their hormone imbalances. And by that itself, it's not that the thyroid is broken or the adrenal is broken, but rather that the eating style is actually imbalancing the hormones in a specific way. And so um, this is the basis of the endocrine diet modification that I use in clinic. So in metabolic typing, we can also take this into consideration because same thing, so there's certain foods that are known to improve or make worse these particular patterns. So, but let's take another example. Let's take the example. Um, I'm going to give the example of a 65 year old female who's really tried everything to lose weight and control blood sugar. You know, she's been monitoring her blood sugar. She's loading up with supplements. She's exercising a lot and getting nowhere, eating clean, avoiding carbs, you know, but the blood sugar was totally not controlled well and the insulin requirements kept going up. So under those conditions, what do you think the most important hormones to balance are? It's like guesses. Anybody have a guess? You write it up in your chat box. Have you got any, th any thoughts about that? What kind of hormones would we be looking to try and balance in a person like that? I know you're out there. <laughs> it's not a test. You can like just uh, just throw something out there. What do you think would be the most important thing to balance? Yeah, insulin, chill, awesome sauce. That's definitely one of them. Can anybody think what the second one might be? Jill's so smart. Come on, Jill. You know what the second one is. <laughs> nope. Nope, she doesn't. She's not even going to try. So the second one would be cortisol. So um, these are both really critical to health and wellness. So, and they're connected. When you're balancing one, you are balancing the other. And by extension, you're balancing all the hormones. So let's take a look at just the effect of those two hormones because they're very commonly imbalanced in people. Um, so let's take a look at um, cortisol. So here are the effects of cortisol imbalance. We can have changes in blood sugar. We can have changes in immune health. Um, this often um, is the reason why if people are too stressed, they, they don't do a great job of defending against um, pathogens. It can affect the digestion. The high cortisol levels can interfere with how well you can get into the digestive process. They affect sleep and recovery. Cortisol affects food choices. It definitely has an impact on the emotions, mental clarity, bone health. Um, high cortisol is probably the biggest determinant factor in bone loss, um, motivation, and insulin resistance. So that's where cells stop responding properly to the hormone insulin. And um, you can also get weight gain from cortisol. So that's just cortisol effects. Then let's just add in insulin effects. So you can, if you have imbalances in insulin, you can have aches and pains, you can have weight gain, you can have um, increased blood pressure, you can have increased cholesterol, sugar cravings, mood problems. Um, there's an association with cancer and with aging, with libido, um, with diabetes, obviously. Um, but you know, in this particular lady's case, um, she was just taking more and more insulin. Well, that was actually contributing to the weight gain over time, which seems completely counterintuitive. But you have to remember that when you are ha having to use an external um, hormone, that you're, you're messing with the balance that the body has got going. And unless you do something to kind of reframe all the rest of them, you're going to start to come up against 
you know, more and more problems over time. Because every time you try and make a correction with an external agent, your body's going to respond. It's, it's, it's such an amazing system. So here's an example of that. Like on the diagram, you can see that the hypothalamus and the pituitary and the adrenal, they're all connected here under something called the HPA axis. And this is actually a, a big part of your stress coping strategy hormonally, this axis. And of course, it's amazing these hormones talk to each other all the time, and they have to because there's so many integrated functions. So if you drop weight and then gain it back, it's a major stressor on your body. And that actually can put the hypothalamus, which is the control system on that, completely out of balance. So if you balance cortisol, you reduce insulin resistance, and that actually resets the hypothalamus and the HPA. And in this case, for this particular lady, the amount of exercise, we needed to terminate the exercise. It was adding so much stress, not just mental stress. We're not talking about mental stress, We're talking about physical amount of stress. So this is why exercise programs can complicate a weight loss strategy. I have just seen people knock themselves out um, exercising, like, which I mean, yeah, you can definitely see that people are getting stronger, maintaining stronger, but it's really interesting because people realize that when they're going for the gusto like this and they're doing it so much that um, nothing moves. In fact, if anything, they feel like, yeah, I mean, I can do more burpees than I ever used to do before, but fundamentally hasn't translated into a change in the shape of my body. The stress hormones are also really strongly related to sleep-wake cycles, which is shown in this diagram. Um, and when somebody is really stressed, we often need to put an emphasis on sleep timing and sunlight exposure to actually get the rhythm back. Um, uh, so sometimes we're actually um, needing to put in things that actually improve sleep, not necessarily put people to sleep, but relax people enough to put them to sleep um, versus, and then have sunlight during the day so that you actually are creating the proper cortisol melatonin cycles in particular. So I don't know if you know this or not, but as cortisol goes up in the day, um, melatonin goes down and at night, the levels of melatonin obviously go up and the levels of cortisol are supposed to go down. And it's like supposed to be this rhythm that's inverse. And the unfortunate part is that, you know, when we have so much stress in our lives, a lot of the time we're not able to um, get an appropriate rest going. If you don't have appropriate rest, you don't have appropriate tissue repair. You don't have great metabolic clearance. There's lots of things that will happen from that. At the end of the day, what I'm trying to say is, you know, like here's one specific strategy for hormone balance in this patient. You know, we need to balance insulin resistance. We need to improve her sleep quality and quantity. We needed to have her eat a balanced meal. We needed, well, we actually used intermittent fasting with her. We need to reduce her overall weight. We needed to can her exercise strategy, which most people would think would be the absolute last thing that I would say. But hormonal imbalances require specific intervention. So it's really important to be able to try to identify those things, whether it's by testing or by questionnaire or whatever um, strategy that we're going to use. Now, next is nervous system. Um, balance. So with metabolic reset, the nervous system is actually really important. We really underappreciate the nervous system. Um, it is an integrated regulatory system. It is literally enmeshed with all tissue functions. And sometimes stressors in the nervous system are a cause of a metabolic issue. Um, as an example, you know, the case of a patient whose doctor, whose family doctor thought the thyroid was off, but even with thyroid hormone, the metabolism didn't normalize. Um, so in her case, it actually wasn't even the hormone. It was stress. It was her major factor. And when under stress, your body is focused on stress and not on normalization. So we can't always change what we're going through, but we really can change how we're going through it. Stress does a lot of damage and most people don't think of themselves as stressed because people normalize stress and they underestimate how much resiliency they're using. And um, they confuse having negative mental talk with stress, but physiological stress has multiple effects. If a lion was chasing you, kidney function would drop 90% 
your digestion would shut down, your detox would shut down, your reproduction would shut down, and all the survival stuff increases. We send our blood to the extremities. Your body doesn't understand, you know, in, in this particular stress circumstance, you're just in bad traffic and in a hurry. <laughs> That's not what that part of the nervous system is really designed for. So we want balance between the rest and digest or um, parasympathetic functions and the fight or flight functions, which are the sympathetic functions. If you don't get to parasympathetic or rest and digest, you don't rest and repair properly. And parasympathetics restore things, they revive things, they help you regenerate things. And like at the end of the day, they also help you reproduce. So it can actually create fertility problems to be under stress. And so sometimes the biggest obstacle to metabolic is this. So to change this factor, you've got to change your lifestyle, your environment, like what you're doing for work or who you're hanging out with, or your automated stress coping strategies that we try and deal with all the time when people are in office. And this is why people like vacations. So if if you're under stress, in about three or four days after vacation, people start to feel more kind of like quote unquote normal. They think it's due to vacation, but what it really is is just your nervous system starts to actually relax and stop being so much in the fight or flight mode all the time. So if you can only relax after a little bit of vacation, it's a good indicator that you can fix your overall tone to more normal if, if you can actually incorporate some strategies that are going to help you lifestyle wise counter stress and there's lots of things that you can do to help your nervous system combat stress you can shift your mindset towards gratitude practices which perhaps you've seen the blogs that talk about that on our blog or you can do heart math training to build resilience and balance the central nervous system um, you can get into nature more frequently you can stop exercising if it makes you feel worse or doesn't energize you you can learn how to eat balanced and organic you can celebrate your life and your successes and not just criticize yourself for all the things that you feel like you're doing wrong. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily take lab tests or pills. You know, sometimes you don't need a pill, you need a skill. So sometimes every single dollar is counting also. So the best value for yourself is investing in your daily practices, taking a good honest look at what's going on and then investing in what you can do yourself that you can make a habit. Now, one other major concern that we've already talked about is detoxification issues. Um, and when we talk about metabolic reset, this is another thing that actually needs to come into play. So if you look at detoxification, detoxification is not a um, breakdown process. People assume toxins are like detoxification somehow involves you destroying a toxin, but that actually isn't true. Toxin removal is very nutritionally based and it's very additive. So in essence, what you're doing is you are using nutrients. You're, you're actually adding nutrients into reactions to activate toxins and then conjugate them. So that's phase one versus phase two. Phase one is you're creating a whole bunch of changes in a molecule so that you can actually add um, pieces to it, a conjugation in the conjugation pathways. You're adding little molecules onto those active sites and making things more soluble in bile. And then you can excrete it in, in like feces basically. So, um, there's obviously elimination techniques, you know, like where we see detoxification um, impulses to like use laxatives or use sauna or use a, a bunch of other things like that. And there's nothing wrong with doing that, but that's not the full detoxification. That's really like the excretion or monctory pathways, and it's not really the preparation of toxins. And why is this important um, is that Predominantly, there is a ton of stored toxins in fat. So it turns out that there's a lot of toxins in the world that actually hang out in your fat um, when you ingest them or become exposed to them. Um, so metals are a great example of that. So lead, mercury, cadmium, all the way down the line, you, arsenic. Um, those metals are very um, fat uh, soluble. So in essence, you can store metal 
uh, exposures in your fat stores. And this is, I'm, I'm showing a diagram here of um, fat that's visceral fat and subcutaneous fat. So you're going to put um, lots of different kinds of toxins into your fat and also into the fat in your nervous system. So your nervous system has a huge amount of fat in it in your brain and in your um, nerves um, that go all over your body, both sensory and motor. So you're, you're basically seeing um, storage of, or like by concentration, basically, you're concentrating those kinds of toxins in fat. So any pesticide or herbicide that you're ingesting, um, if it's not dealt with, can get stored in fat. Um, preservatives, food additives, um, environmental pollutants, so any like oil um, derivatives, petrochemical derivatives, um, smokes, all those things. Those things can actually be stored and so can plastics. So this is one of the reasons why they are known to have hormone disruption effects is because they're fatty molecules that look like hormones. Um, and it should all kind of scare you just a little tiny bit. <laughs> Actually, it probably should share, scare you a lot. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't scare us enough. Um, and so as a consequence, we continue to use these compounds in, in our environment, um, in food packaging. Um, for heaven's sakes, please don't microwave stuff in plastic containers and, you know, like... Um, where you can buy organic, that's awesome, especially with things that tend to be very fatty, like animal products, um, like butter and cheese and things like that, or meat. If you can do those things wild, um, and by wild, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, metal or toxin free, but wherever you can to minimize your exposure, of course, that's best case scenario. But what can actually happen is you can store a lot of toxins and fat. And when you do that, what ends up happening is when you lose weight, those toxins um, basically recirculate. And I've actually seen um, a couple of people um, with who've done the Bernstein diet. Now, this is not a negative against the Bernstein diet um, itself. This is, this is not unique to the Bernstein diet. But what happens in the Bernstein diet is that there's a very, very um, fast mobilization of fat out of fat stores. Um, and the unfortunate problem is that they don't do anything to um, to mitigate the amounts of toxins that are coming out. And there are research studies um, published in mainstream journals that show that in most weight loss strategies, part of the problem is that you suddenly get massive increases in like pesticide residues in your um, uh, bloodstream. That because obviously you can measure in your bloodstream, they're carried on carrier proteins in your in your blood. Um, because they're fatty compounds, most of them. So they're they're easy to measure that way. And unfortunately, a lot of them are metabolic toxins. So in essence, what you do is you start this process, you start to mobilize fat, you start to notice a difference, and then all of a sudden it shuts down or plateaus. Well, what is that? Sometimes it's actually um, becoming intoxicated with your own stored toxins. And I've seen a couple of people, like I said, on the Bernstein diet, break up out into horrifying rashes or have it precipitate a major health crisis. Not because they weren't trying to do something healthy for themselves, but because in so doing, they actually dislodged things that they didn't realize were there and weren't handled appropriately. So not good. So a part of a metabolic reset really should include um, taking a look at um, uh, like what, what your exposure is like and whether or not you have symptomatology that's that's kind of close to a known toxin or set of toxins. And, and we can help because there's definitely um, questionnaires and stuff uh, for that. So make sure to ask me about that if you are curious. Now, I also wanted to give you the opportunity here to do something a little bit different. So I am going to propose that we actually potentially make a metabolic reset group. Now, by group, I actually mean there's a couple things that I'm thinking about doing. So what I wanna do is I wanna cover um, getting the right diet for you and evaluating your toxic symptoms and toxin exposure. Um, taking your, your hormones into account, looking at your hormone types, looking at your mindset and figuring out um, if I can give you the skills for mastering some of those things. 
a stressor's evaluation is for, stretcher, stress, uh, for stress and improving your sleep. Um, so Jill, this really would speak to past stress and PTSD. You know, those definitely leave an imprint on the autonomic nervous system. And sometimes you need strategies to learn how to reprogram what those things are. Um, one of them is like mental field technique, which I've listed here with heart math training. These are incredible techniques that are proven to have profound physiological effects both in a health category and also in the um, subconscious programming category. Heart math, if you've never heard about it, is actually a set of techniques that creates such a dramatic um, change in the interaction between your physical heart and your reptilian brain that it's one of the best predictors like how good your heart rate variability is. So this is a measure of the increase and decrease in your relative pulse speed. If you have a well-trained um, a heart math patient, you'll see these beautiful sine wave rhythms in the increase and decrease in heart rate. And it's such a good health predictor if you're good at this and you practice this, that it's actually more um, predictive of the chances of you having an adverse um, effect like diabetes than your blood sugar is. That's how profound nervous system programming and working with the nervous system can be. And they're not hard techniques to learn. And they're certainly not hard to incorporate in a metabolic reset. You do also need to optimize your digestion, um, which also will change your microbiome a lot of the time. So we don't do always a great job of sitting down and eating meals and making sure that our digestion is great. And I have definitely seen a massive increase in the last 20 years um, in poor digestive health, leading to crazy bacterial condition problems. Um, and this also, this is another major thing we didn't have really the chance to discuss yet, but how your, the composition of the flora in your gut um, can actually play a big role in weight loss. And there are actually probiotics that are specifically designed to help improve um, weight regulation. We'd also need to do like nutrient deficiency analyses, which we can do, and evaluating like even your most recent lab work. So what I'd actually like to propose, and I'm hoping that I'll have some takers on this, is I would like to actually start having some group visits. Now by group visits, I mean like things where we actually build them as visits and work together in a group. Now this is something where we can optimize a lot of things. And so here's, here's my plan. I'm hoping that you will think about participating. Um, I like to do eight 90 minute group visits where we actually literally go through all of this stuff and do it weekly for the first month and then every two weeks for two more months. Um, the cool thing is if we do it as a group visit and you do have some insurance coverage, insurance should technically help with the cost because when you have a consult with me um, we can, and we're going to bill them as consults, then we can actually work together as a group and take advantage of that. So what I want to do is um, do an evaluation phase and a detox phase if you need or a hormone support phase if you need and actually set everybody up for like success on all these areas and to pull all of these resources together for all of these topics and just introduce you all to each other because you guys are all awesome. I, I'm always so impressed with my patients. I just think as a group, if you all sat down in the same room with each other, you would be thrilled to know each other um, because you guys are great. I, I'm always amazed at what you will do and, and the things that you are um, like even just being on this call, right? Being on this call and trying to learn more about this. You're just like way up there on the top end of the patient category. So no pressure in a group, but just great support and feedback. And because sometimes it's easier when you have people around you there that are after the same thing. Um, of course, you always have my unwavering support. <laughs> always, regardless of whether or not you do it like this or not. Um, and you would have basically... A private group with me. So if we do it like this, you would basically um, save about 75% of like 
how much you would otherwise pay for my time to go through all of that. But because of that format, we can get all sorts of work done. Um, and then if we have identified the need for lab testing or whatever, we can do that separately. Or if we identify issues that need supplemental support, we can do that separately. And that'll totally vary from person to person. Most of you should really be able to sort most of these things out without any of that. So I'm thinking, with, you know, to see each other and talk to each other by video so you can see everybody's face, <laughs> cover the main topic of the, se the session and review some homework pieces and do work with each other to get all these things sorted. Um, I'm hoping to do it on Tuesdays for about an hour and a half, starting in about two weeks. So um, I'm hoping you'll consider it. I, I think this would be a great opportunity. I get frustrated sometimes because I can't always spend I, enough time with you to go over every single one of these things. Um, a lot of the time I am helping you put out fires and then when everybody feels normal, <laughs> they, they don't ask me these questions anymore until we hit to the, nice, the next crisis. So I wanna be proactive with you and start a different kind of strategy. Um, so. Overall, that's going to cost you, I've actually put it down to $595 instead of $600, although $600 would be, if you calculate it out, it's actually $600. But it's actually, I found out that that number is all about reframing old things and moving out of the old and into the new. And so I thought $595 is my number. Um, and so basically, we'd be billing that as is it's for you all. Now, Obviously, this is not for somebody like who's so ill that they have a debilitating chronic disease and they need more individual help. It's really for people who are like going to deeply value their health, they're highly coachable, just like the people on this call, they like accountability, they're responsive to the positive feedback, they're honest with themselves and other people. The goal of this program is not perfect. It's just the goal is for personal growth and for movement in your metabolism. And I think the amount of weight loss that you're going to lose is going to vary you know, first 10 pounds is always easiest, last 10 of your goal is always the hardest, and everything in between is gonna depend on compliance and the effort that you put forth. So we're really gonna design this to gently and safely create, create better metabolic balance. I'm, ex I'm actually expecting people to lose about 15 to 20 pounds in 12 weeks, depending on how much you have to lose. So we're gonna be eating things that are as appropriate for us as possible. So teaching you the basics and even just making, like I said, small changes towards the right way for eating for you. Um, and if you're on medication, we'll evaluate things to make sure there's no contraindications because people on blood pressure and diabetes medications often need to carefully monitor their levels. If we get the things right, you can actually get a lot more normalization of blood sugar and, and blood pressure levels. And so if you're diabetic, you know, we would make mod uh, modifications to that. And again, not a huge exercise patterning because the basis of this is to reset your nervous system to a state of healing and repair. And most exercise programs are far too demanding and they just create more problems. So during the first phase of the program, you'll be like doing yoga or walking or rebounding or sauna, things that are a bit more gentle. Um, and I do feel like this, this could be permanent. This is not just we're going to let you lose 20 pounds and then set you off on your way to regain it. It's going to correspond, obviously, with your adherence to a healthy lifestyle. And it's important to really follow the upgraded lifestyle. You know, it's, again, it's not about perfection. It's the pursuit of your best self. So if you're strictly doing this program just to look good, this is not the program for you. It's for those that really want to... Um, do the work to, to feel good and then look good as a consequence, not just fit into the wedding dress per se. So, you know, and if we get to the end of 12 weeks, really, you could cycle through the phases as many times as you like. And then, um, you know, whatever supports you need, you, you totally can continue to have. So if you have more questions about this, um, please don't hesitate to email or call me so we can discuss whether or not it's appropriate for you. Like I said, I think the biggest thing is here that we can create a strategy where we can have mutual support between everyone and also find a way of making this work so that you get the maximum amount of, you know, benefit for the least amount of money. As another reminder, here's the next events in the series. So obviously we've gotten to metabolic reset so far. Next, we're going to do root causes of digestive disorders in our free webinar. Of course, if we do the program together, you're going to know way much more about that by the time you get there anyway. And um, also, we're going to do one 
uh, a free webinar on sleep in March. Thanks for watching. I love to connect to my patient community to inform and inspire, and I hope you will join us again in the near future. Don't forget to check out whole-life-medicine.com for more webinars and events.